This is going to be part two of our pencil holder demo, making a pencil holder out of steel in the metal shop. This is uh, where we left off. We had our part all formed up out of uh, 11 gauge steel from the uh, bulldozer die, and now we've come to the part where we need to fixture it all together and get it clamped, ready to go for the welding process. So I've got a big old aluminum block here as a fixturing block as well as a heat sink as well as a smaller one to help align those two surfaces together and uh, and I'll also check this uh, top surface and you can see that it's not quite sitting right so that's going to be typical of a few pieces uh, right off the bender so here's uh, one method for getting it clamped uh, good and true again just take uh, a couple of pieces of uh, square or rectangular whatever works in your part and, uh, and with your particular clamps, uh, I find these um, F-style clamps work pretty well. And I'm just putting one on either side to hold the part down. And, uh, and you can see those two edges are lining up a little bit better. And if uh, you loosen that first clamp you put on, you'll see that those two other clamps will take over. And if it needs a little bit of nudging with a hammer, uh, you know, give it a few taps, play with the different clamps, and then cinch them back down uh, once you've got it. Uh, lined up pretty well. So we'll check it again with our combo square and we've got a good surface there and we're looking pretty good on top as well and so I think we're ready for welding. So we're going to set up uh, a MIG welder for this. Uh, first make sure your ground clamp is hooked up either to the part or to the table and then uh, be nice with these uh, welding leads. You don't want to kink them or wrestle them around uh, too roughly as they can get uh, uh, bound up. Uh, we're going to ease open the tank argon CO2 cylinder here, and then we're going to open it all the way. It's a high-pressure cylinder, and we can see on that dial gauge that we have pressure. We have two different MIG welders, two different charts, so we're going to use whichever uh, chart corresponds with the MIG welder. We're on the 250 at the moment, so we're going to go for eighth-inch material, which is uh, the 11-gauge material we're working with, power on the welder, and then uh, use the settings that the chart says. It's a pretty good starting point. Make sure your machine is on full range and, uh, and set your wire speed and voltage uh, accordingly. Uh, once all that's good, you may want to turn the exhaust on. Good idea to uh, get rid of any welding fumes and um, the switch is located over by the window. And bring over one of these fume extraction hoods and uh, make sure that the uh, louver is set to pull the gases out. About a foot or so away is fine. Get on one of these uh, welding shirts. This is a cotton welding shirt for some of the light duty stuff we're, we're typically doing around the metal shop. Don your uh, welding hat. This happens to be, um, or welding mask, this happens to be an auto darkening mask and uh, some lighter gloves are usually fine uh, MIG gloves uh, I'm wearing. The welpers are usually stationed over on the wall by the charts. Uh, welding pliers, great for trimming the wire. Use the recessed end and it'll automatically give you a pretty good stick out for your MIG welder. And then bring that wire close to but not touching your part and give it a firm zap for tack weld. If it sticks, just give it another little tap at the trigger there to free it up. And uh, there's a good tack. Um, once you're satisfied with how the tack is uh, holding your parts together, you can remove the clamps. and. Um, you can see, uh, even if your aim is a little off, the nice thing about that aluminum is that the welds won't stick to it. So free your part and uh, do a little more checking here. We want to make sure that that uh, bottom surface, what is a top surface now, is flat. If it isn't, do a little grinding, do a little filing, and you're going to use that as your next uh, clamping surface up against the table. So you can see the bottom opened up a little bit, and we're going to do a little bit more clamping and fixturing. Uh, to get the tack on the other side. So back on with our aluminum block and our aluminum plate. Uh, I've got even a little less room this time to work with, but I'm clamping inside the tube there. It's a little hard to tell with that clamp um, so that it becomes a little sandwich across that front face. And I'm checking it again with the combo square as I go. And if the uh, root of your weld, the seam is still a little bit open, which is typical, just throw another clamp across that uh, those two sides and give it another tack to, uh, to hold it all together. So one more quick zap, again, free the wire. You can see that tack is right on top of the aluminum, uh, especially that smaller plate, and watch how it just uh, pops right off, um, no problems. Um, 
So the aluminum really won't stick to the steel unless you do some pretty crazy stuff. It's pretty flat across the top, so I'm satisfied with how the fit up is going so far. Now it's time to actually weld that seam. I'm reclamping the large aluminum heat sink on there, offset a little bit uh, so that I can have access to the seam, clamping it down to the table so it doesn't move around on me. And I'm going to bring over a brick to help prop up my hand. And this is always a good technique to kind of try your hand out, make adjustments uh, to see if you've got good motion of travel across the seam. Here's a, a pretty, pretty blurry arc shot, but gives you an idea of about how fast I'm moving. And I'm doing a little zigzag pattern there uh, with, the, um, with the MIG gun. And uh, once you complete your weld, you should have, um, and, and let it cool down a little bit, you should uh, have a pretty good result if you're using one of those heat sinks on the bottom uh, inside part. Um, it'll take away the excess heat that you might have if you're learning and moving a little slower. And uh, you can see I don't have any sag through or burn through, but I have a pretty decent penetration on that part and everything's flat inside still. So that aluminum um, heat sink or chill block is a really useful tool uh, to have for welding, MIG welding, tape welding, whatever it might be. So keep that in your kit. Now we got to think about putting on that bottom plate and just like we did in part one where we pre-chamfered the edges that we're going to meet up and that weld we just produced uh, to give that weld somewhere to go, um, help with the penetration, uh, we're going to chamfer the four bottom edges of this um, square part. And so I'm just giving a few more swipes with that sanding disc, similar to how I did uh, in part one of the video, and I'm just going to rotate it around. Always make sure that you're clamping your part down, two hands on the grinder, and uh, keep those sparks, um, you know, shooting mostly downward for safety's sake, and use welding screens um, and gloves and all that, all that stuff, so face shield. Once I've got uh, all four of my edges, it's time to uh, you know, chamfered. Now it's time to put that bottom plate on. So we've got that three and a quarter inch square bottom plate. I'm going to clamp it down here, making sure that my edges are all lined up pretty well, uh, or at least centered on that plate somewhat. And then I'm just going to trace the four corners with a scribe here because they've got a little bit of a radius and I want to remove that excess material. If you've got a little bit of funny fit up issue, you can scribe along the uh, lines as well. Uh, you know, the edges of your part. I'm also going to do a little thing here where I put a little dot uh, on the two parts as they're going to mate up because if there is some irregularities, now I know that later on uh, my part will go back together the same way. Uh, over to the disc sander, you could use a grinder if you'd like. Uh, face shield, of course, is a must. No gloves on, uh, on this disc sander and always keep your part flat. Got to keep it moving too so you don't wear out that disc. And I'm just going to carefully uh, follow my scribe lines on the corners and uh, any light sanding I might need to do for the uh, the other edges. And so just um, use some even pressure. Don't overload that uh, that sanding disc and never tip your part uh, down into the wheel. That could uh, be a real recipe for da disaster and uh, pull your plate and your fingers and hand into that disc with it. So uh, be real careful, careful here and uh, always keep that part, um, you know, firmly on the table surface. When I'm satisfied, uh, we're good to go. And uh, here's just a quick reminder, always, always, always keep your part flat on the table. Now we're back over to the table, line our parts with that little witness mark I made earlier. And uh, we're going to uh, hold it horizontally here and put a, uh, a bar across the top to hold that uh, cap in place and uh, carefully trying to make sure that my edges line up my carefully ground edges uh, and if they need a little bit of persuasion what the, the clamp is on there you could always just use a little block of something to help line them up tap them in place and when they feel good then you're ready to tap uh, tack them together so here I am back with the MIG welder I've got the whelpers out and, uh, and it's time to just tack the four corners always a good practice to get into which is to tack the uh, the extreme edges of whatever you're welding together while it's all clamped and fixtured and then that way you know your parts not going to move around too much um, so I've got uh, four tack welds one on each corner and now I'm ready to uh, remove those clamps on a small part like this I don't have to worry about too much distortion uh, if you wanted to you could move around a chill block inside there if you're worried about burning through inside there 
or if you have some gaps to fill. And then here you can see how I'm propping up my hand and just guiding that, um, guiding that nozzle in, uh, keeping that angle pretty high and, uh, and welding my seams. So you want to do all four seams like that, just rotate the part around and, uh, and once you've got all four welded, you'll be ready for the next task. Uh, here's a, a little bit sharper of an um, arc shot. See what it looks like under the hood. Clamp this down for grinding, always. Uh, I'm going to first start out with a pretty aggressive um, grinding wheel here, standard grinding wheel, uh, aluminum oxide grinding wheel, and um, make sure that you assemble that properly uh, and have it unplugged when you're changing out discs and wheels and things like that. Um, I do have a video on how to assemble the grinder with different wheels. This is where you can get into uh, some learning and technique about how to grind things properly. I'm going to be real careful here about how I, I swipe uh, and, and, and make my passes here. So initially you're really just trying to grind that weld off and you'll notice here uh, with this close up uh, how my wheel is moving across the surface. So if you notice how that shiny uh, grind spot will kind of, um, that freshly ground area will change with the light, with the lighting. That's because I'm changing the direction my uh, grind uh, marks are facing with each pass. And if I need to linger on a high spot here or there, I will. Um, and I'm just real careful with each stroke uh, how I'm coming down and, uh, and lifting off and trying not to pause too long with the wheel in one spot. And just crossing each successive pass, I'll do a slightly different angle grind mark, and that's what keeps you from uh, reinforcing and gouging uh, one particular high or low spot in your part. So really great technique there for grinding, um, no matter what uh, sort of media you're using, uh, sanding discs, grinding with discs, flap wheels, is to just alternate your stroke with each pass and you'll have much better results. Uh, so take your time with it and you'll uh, you'll get better with an angle grinder. It's a good and, uh, in my opinion, really necessary skill if you're going to be a metal worker. So once you've got all the high spots knocked off on each weld, you can see I still left the parent metal, the, the, the original surface of the steel around it, uh, on there, but I took it pretty far down because these next wheels that I intend to use, that's an 80 grit pad, is just a sanding disc. It's not super aggressive. And it's uh, got a um, a backer shim on there as well. You've got the backer pad, but behind the backer pad I've got a shim, and I'm just showing you here how how close to the surface uh, that sanding disc is to the guard. That allows me to get a really low angle, which is critical with these sanding pads, and uh, and I'm just kind of demonstrating how how low I can get with with that sanding pad on the part, and that's that's pretty critical if you're going to be using one of those standard. Uh, sanding pads. And here you've got a pretty similar uh, operation going. You've got opportunity to uh, to really scratch your part up if you don't have the angles quite right. Here you can use a little bit of um, light pressure as you're coming down and then a little bit of increased pressure as you know, you're in your the middle of your stroke and then lighten up the pressure as you come off. It's a, it's a technique that you've got to do a lot of in order to um, you know, get better at and, and sort of practice intentionally and take your time initially and you'll get better results. Um, cross those, those grind marks with each pass, come down easy. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as kind of like a plane landing and taking off of a runway. You don't ever pause as you're changing directions on your part. You always uh, lift the grinder at the beginning and end of each stroke. Uh, here is how I'm doing my corners, just lightly tapping it, uh, I shouldn't even really say tapping, just sort of grazing the edge and then changing the angle each time and keeping the grind marks parallel with the corner as I go so that I don't, uh, you know, gouge into that corner either, either end of it, um, taking the corner off entirely. And so you can see I'm matching the radius that I put in there with the, the bender earlier. And then you can just follow through and do each surface and at this point, I'm switching over to a finer grit sandpaper. This one's uh, a 120 pad to take out some of the heavier scratches of that 80 grit pad. And here you'll just get into a, a finer finish. So I'm really just sort of doing a light pass here, uh, taking off the grind marks from the earlier pass and, uh, 
and making sure that I've, you know, I'm dancing the part in the light there so that I can see uh, each each grind mark what's going on. Um, once you get the 120 pad, you can take it further with, a, you know, a knot wire wheel, one of those flap wheels. I'm going to play around with one of these non-woven abrasives, sometimes referred to as a Rolock pad or a Scotch Bright pad. It's uh, a Velcro back one. This particular one, you could put it on just like one of those earlier sanding discs, but I've got one of these Velcro pads here. Can be very dangerous, so uh, be careful about you know catching on the edges of parts with one of these pads if you are going to try and use one. They're also pretty expensive. Um, at the time of this filming, they're probably around three bucks a pad or more, uh, depending on where you're getting them. So uh, you can really burn them up pretty quick. But you can see how. Uh, how much smoother that part gets with each successive, you know, grit as you take it further and further down. I'll leave it up to the individual as to how smooth they want to get this part. Uh, you could even go as far as to use one of these uh, orbital sanders um, and just keep going. That's really great if you wanted to like patina it, uh, you know, use like a chemical patina, you know, after that that uh, Rolox sanding disc. One thing I do recommend, though, is uh, making sure that it's burr-free. You don't want to cut up somebody's hands if this is going to be a gift or something you're using, so check carefully with an ungloved hand for any sharp edges and knock them down with a file or a deburring tool or a bit of sandpaper or emery cloth uh, and make sure that your part's uh, nice and smooth to the finish. And that's uh, good with all, all welding projects. You want to make sure you don't have any sharp edges that somebody's going to cut themselves on. So here's our finished part. I left some of the edges a little raw just for demonstration purposes uh, for when we're looking at this thing in, in class. And uh, later on you may want to uh, put a patina on this or um, at the very least some sort of a preventative, uh, rust preventative, um, penetrol or uh, some kind of an oil or paint could work. And uh, and if you're going to make one of these, just uh, make sure to be safe in the shop, get clearance on all the tools, and uh, good luck.